Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles and Yegolu. Now, Nigerians are still digesting the surprising news that Namdi Kanu, leader of the outlawed separatist group, the indigenous people of Biafra, or IPOB, has been arrested and extradited to Abuja. He's been wanted for many years, and his organization has been proscribed as a terrorist group by the Nigerian government. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, told Nigerians that Mr. Kanu was repatriated on Sunday. He was taken to court on Tuesday in Abuja, but no journalist was allowed into the courtroom. The judge ordered that he be detained by the Nigerian secret police, the DSS. The judge also ordered that the hearing of Mr. Kanu's case be accelerated. Before he fled Nigeria, Mr. Kanu had been standing trial for terrorism, felony, and unlawful possession of firearms. He was granted bail, but he left Nigeria following reports that his house was invaded, some say attacked, by the Nigerian army. He has now, of course, been rearrested, and his case has been adjourned till the 26th of July. And there he is in chains. Well, for more on the legal implications of Namdi Kanu's arrest, uh, I'm joined now in the studio by Henry Kelechuku Eniotu, who is a lawyer and senior partner at the firm Law Corridor. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Uh, thank you very much. From a legal point of view, doesn't Namdi Kanu have a case? I mean, he clearly is innocent until proven guilty under the laws of the land. Right. Basically, um, I will say that um, Namdi Kano, as of today, does have a case until, as, we, as you said earlier, he proves guilty. By the pro provisions of the Nigerian law, the constitution, which is the ground norm of the land, by virtue of section 36, it says and presumes that all persons who are alleged to have committed an offence will be presumed innocent until proven guilty. For now, the government has not proven him as alleged and the court has not held him to be a convict so for now he remains a suspect or a defendant as the case may be mm. so for now i would basically say that he has a case until the government puts forward credible evidence convincing evidence enough for the courts to be able to ground a conviction with respect to Namdi Kano. right well let's drill down further into that assertion that he has a case um because beyond the the broad strokes which is that he's innocent until proven guilty right. um he was given bail well. he left because he said he was under threat from the authorities who uh, apparently invaded his house does well. that give strengthen his case for not being for basically jumping bail i would basically say that um the law in nigeria as it is today remains that um upon a court granting you bail bail as a matter of fact is a matter of discretion and the court while exercising the hair power to grant you bail must do so judiciously and judicially now um upon the court granting you bail the bail is usually dependent on conditions mm. these conditions are conditions which at all times must be respected part of the conditions in with respect to Nam Kano was that he would not have been granted access out of nigeria his passport and other issues should have been deposited with the court well they were actually and, and they were the so obviously, had uh, both his we, 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 yeah obviously which obviously means um, we, i'm still at a loss as to how he was able to escape the borders of the country because um, without a passport, he shouldn't be able to leave the borders of the country. Well, as, as a way of digressing slightly Very and well. not taking the, the, your, your t train of thought away from you, uh, well. according to this day newspaper, which did a thorough investigation into this, um, oh. it, it has impeccable sources. And those sources have told uh, this day that it is probable that the British government helped him to leave Nigeria. That's the only way he could have left, left the borders of this country. country. Okay. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to left. But that's a uh, to leave. But that's a probability, Very well. um, and and not a one hundred percent certainty. But that's what the sources have, have told said. this okay. day newspaper. Okay, relying on that, if I'm to rely on the premise of that source, I would basically say that Nigeria remains a sovereign nation, and as a sovereign nation, we have we are governed by laws. And our laws remain in place till date until set aside. The bail granted to Nandi Kano remains subsisting 
until the day it was revoked by the same court upon an application by the attorney office of the attorney general mm. of the federation on the grounds because every person who is accused of having committed an offense and charged before a court in nigeria is expected to appear before the court at all times when the court has called upon such a person to appear before her and in any in, in the event where such a person a defendant is unavailable to attend to his trial the court has the inherent power upon being applied for grant an order revoking the said bill and upon such bill being revoked the, the law enforcement agencies are under with they are within their powers to take all necessary steps to effect the rearrest of such a person who is who may have gone away and of course that that bail was revoked so, by, obviously by, it was revoked by, by uh, honorable justice in Nyako, yeah. yes, Bintan Nyako, yes obviously so since if that bail has been revoked obviously i will say that um the entire process of his rearrests the entire process of his rearrest particularly as it relates to bringing him before a competent court of record to stand his trial and to also prove his innocence as the case may be for now remains legitimate until further facts mm. until further facts are brought forth to the public upon which the public can now form an opinion as to whether or not the proprietoriness or otherwise of the said entire process mm. that's a very interesting very legally down the barrel straight down the barrel analysis um, the, the point, of course, is that just to get you to interpret for us, because I, what you, you've said, we obviously take on board. I mean, the, the hearing hasn't actually begun. Yet, so well. until those elements are introduced and yeah. made public, well. we can't make a, an assessment. Well. Um, but broadly speaking, in your expertise, area sort of expertise and, and the experience you have in these legal matters, mm -hmm given the fact that he's saying that the reason he skipped the country was because his house was invaded and there is evidence to support the fact that his house was in fact invaded and that he felt threatened and therefore he he skipped i mean is that is that admissible <coughs> that um, those facts for now those facts remain speculative mm. because um the courts of our land, particularly the High Court and the Federal High Courts and mm. other superior courts of record, are courts of record which deals with evidence, cogent and clear evidence brought forth before it. What we only know are facts or statements made in the media. Those media statements do not constitute evidence mm. before the courts. And the court could not leave the courtroom to the realm of the media Absolutely. to understand basically what is happening. So until Nandekano obviously has um, the rights, as we have said, to bring forth those facts and evidence to support, his case. to support his case yeah. with respect to why he escaped the borders of the land with respect to standing his trial. Mm. Until that is done, any other statements made in the media will not constitute evidence before the court and the court has no business whatsoever delving into those areas of discourse. If you were his lawyer, what would you be doing right now? <laughs> Very good question. Maybe he may need to seek uh, my um, legal <laughs> expertise with respect to that. However, like basically... Um, well, now's your <laughs> opportunity to <laughs> sell yourself. <laughs> yeah, obviously, it's, um, it's a simple issue. The lawyer is basically expected to, at this stage, put out um, an affidavit. An affidavit of facts. Stating in clear terms and in clear paragraphs. Giving an, an annexing exhibits and other facts which will be relevant to enable the courts to reach a logical judicial and judicial conclusion with respect to the reasoning behind why he has failed at various intervals and at various adjournments to appear before the courts. But that's the first stage. That's right? the first stage. Right. Upon that being done, upon the, upon the council doing that, the courts will be expected at that stage to make a pronouncement. That pronouncement, upon being made, entitles him constitutionally a right of appeal if not made in his favor and that process will continue up until it gets to the apex courts which is the supreme court and until the supreme court makes a pronouncement with respect to that particular issue his right remains subsistent hmm. until otherwise it's proven and i would basically say for uh, which is of utmost importance that um nam Kano escaping the borders of the land to protect his life obviously it's only a living that will stand 
to defend his innocence mm. or prove his innocence. Only the living can stand trial. However, it was equally incumbent upon him to have notified his shorty because part of the conditions for his bail was for him to provide reliable shorties, individuals of impeccable standing in public, who were expected to stand and guarantee his presence in court at all times the court requires his presence. Now, these shorties included Senator Eina Baribe mm. of the National Assembly and one other religious leader of his belief. Now, at the time when he was escaping the borders of the land while trying to um, protect himself from being killed, he owed it a duty. It was incumbent on him to have comp in given information or details of his movement to his shorties. So at the time when the court makes any request as to his presence being needed in court, his shorties, as usual, will now provide an affidavit showing costs why the defendant at the time when he was required to be in court was unable to be in court at the time that's very interesting and so do you see the possibility given what you've just said i mean again you don't have all the facts available to very you well, so let's well. be cognizant of that very well. um but in in from what we know well. um speaking generally yes. um if you were his lawyer would you go for would you try to secure bail for him again in the circumstances <laughs> or, or, or would you feel like you know it's a total waste of time really because given the the things that have happened extremely difficult <laughs> i must say um it's uh, it's extremely difficult for him to be granted bail again simply and the premise for my reasoning on this issue is premised on two points one being the fact that he has jumped bail there was an earlier bail granted he jumped it it's been revoked and secondly, the nature of the allegations for which he is being tried for. These two issues are very vital in the court exercising her discretion, judiciously and judicially. With respect to the first, him having jumped bail, the courts are enjoined at all times to protect the sanctity and, and respect of the court at all times. Being that he had been granted bail after a very painstaking exercise with respect to obtaining his bill mm. in the first instance. His unavailability to attend to his trial consistently without any verifiable or reasonable reason before the courts. And the inability of his shorties as well mm. to provide him at the time when the court required him to be present would be very difficult grounds upon which I as a counsel will further go to apply to the same courts. Because the court obviously will look through his record and obviously see that this man, who I granted bail in the first instance, he jumped to bail. Mm. What is the guarantee that he will not do the same again? Particularly now, considering the point you raised earlier with respect to the British government having a role in his escape from the borders. It obviously means that I the mean Nigerian government... Probable role. Probable, probably. Right. Uh, yeah. Now, it obviously means that the Nigerian government are not totally in control or in charge mm. of his movements. So his presence in court cannot be guaranteed now, that is a very difficult issue to disprove because these are facts which are verifiable and, and which the courts must obviously have already taken judicial notice of. That's a fascinating analysis. Stay with us. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching no. The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Barrister Henry Kelechuku Enyotu on the legal implications of Namdi Kanu's arrest. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now, as you probably know, the trending topic in Nigeria at the moment is the reapprehension of the leader of the separatist group, IPOB Namdi Kanu. Lots of issues there, not least the legal implications of his rearrest and arraignment before an Abuja court without legal counsel. What does that tell us about whether we can expect a free and fair trial? Well, with me in the studio, Barrister Henry Kelechuku Enyotu, who is, uh, of course, uh, from the uh, law firm. He's a senior partner at uh, Law Corridor, and uh, he is still with me in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for uh, staying with us. Well, what do you Thank think you. about that s suggestion? And again, I say it 
reservedly because it is a suggestion we don't know all the facts but the suggestion that he appeared in court without legal counsel on tuesday <coughs> without mincing the words i would say that um that would be a gross um, violation of the constitutional provision with respect to his right to fair hearing and um i say that without any fear of contradiction mm. the reason being that um the constitution be remains the ground norm of the land and at all stages and times up upon which a person is being brought before a court, the person, particularly with respect to the gravity of offence for which mm. the defendant is being charged here, the defendant is entitled at all times to a counsel of his choice who will be in court to enable him represent the interests of the defendant and to enable him observe and ensure that the rights of the defendant are fully granted to him while in court so, so if indeed if indeed he was arraigned or he was brought before the courts without his right to a counsel being afforded him i will say without fear that um, that was completely wrong however however uh the the the, the governments or those who brought him before the court may come under the um defense that the application was brought ex parte, mm. considering that what they basically went for was a remand order, an order to remand him within the DSS presence, basically, not with respect to taking him to court to stand trial. Yeah, but even in those circumstances, yes. he has the right for a lawyer to put up some measure of defense, doesn't he, to say that this is not a justifiable act at this particular time as i said earlier it depends on circumstances the mm. circumstances here if the application brought before the judge was one brought ex party in such an instance the right. defendant has no right right to and it um, is probable that it was it's probable yeah. most likely most likely because likely. because i mean the, the, the next question i was going to ask you was that it would be astonishing if a judge allowed yeah. such a thing to Very take well. place wouldn't yes. it Particularly because um, the Federal High Court is a court of record. Mm. And being a court of record will only entertain applications brought by it properly. What do I mean properly? Through a process of law recognized by law. Mm. Which obviously means that the prosecuting counsel in this instance would have brought an application. And applications are, now, are not brought orally to the court in this instance because the court must not, would not have sat in the open court most likely this matter may have been had in chambers or in the open court i do not know because i was not there however even if it was had in open courts applications before superior courts of record are expected to be brought in the form of a motion and a motion could be either a motion on notice or a motion ex parte if ex parte the need for counsel for the defendant may be dispensed with however if via a motion on notice then there's expected to be a time for return to enable the other party file a counter affidavit mm. or a defense with respect to the application and in this instance it's obviously seems that the application was made via a motion party, and um, that will not be challenged or is not questionable if that indeed was what happened right now still looking at the legal um, issues surrounding this um, the, the journalists were not allowed in the courtroom um, when that took place is that something that falls within the jurisdiction of the courts to say we will not allow members of the public who the journalists represent the, the nigerian populace yes, yes. who are the essentially the the owners, owners of the of constitution, constitution not to turn up in court um indeed that's an interesting aspect of um, the whole proceedings which happened um two days it, 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 yesterday mm. um basically um the reason being that as i said earlier He's equally ent entitled and say, by the constitution. He has a right for fair and public hearing. Public, I mean. The constitution was very explicit in this provision. It says all hearing, all trial must be done in public. So what would except be the circumstances? Okay, go on. You said except. That's except, the word I was looking yes. for. Except in a situation where, for example, a minor is being tried, then um, the um, privacy and the mm. circumstances of the nature matter will entire will give the court the power to preclude or prevent the press from coming to cover such this thing. However, I must say, D does it preclude the press or does it impose reporting restrictions on the press? 
uh, it depends in the circumstances as well. It could uh, impose generally all matters before a court. There is already a natural imposition on the press on the way they report mm. happenings in court, being the matter being subjudice. However, in particular matters of national importance, which requires disclosure of um, maybe classified information, matters which in deals with children, whose um, with particular with respect to sexual offense and other mm. issues. Now, there are instances where the, the law has given the courts the power to um, impose some restriction as to the level of public coverage of such particular proceedings. Um, unfortunately, our laws have not developed to the extent where um, what happened in South Africa and what happened in the United States with respect to shoving some trial, mm. Derek. Now, we, we, our laws have not developed to that extent where we have live coverage of court proceedings for the whole world and for everyone to see. Our laws are for now a bit more conservative in these provisions because it basically says that um, public here doesn't necessarily mean everybody. Basic, it could basically mean parties directly involved in the matter. And who are the parties directly involved in the criminal matter? Usually the nominal complements, the defendants, his counsel, the state counsel, and witnesses. That, that qualifies as public yes, in I the see Nigerian law. Now, with respect to the issue of press coverage, as I said earlier, hmm. the, a matter being subjudice, there is usually already an imposition of restriction with respect to the level the media can cover or the level of reportage that can be made by the media. So, um, in as much as I, I do not want to reach a certain conclusion with respect to the way the particular proceedings happened yesterday as to why the, the media were prevented, I do not know the reasoning or the logic behind it. However, I must say, that the constitution guarantees that every defendant who is brought before a court for trial must be tried in public, not right. in secret. Could, could all those issues come up going forward, if you were his lawyer, to say that these are all the reasons why due process has not been followed and therefore, you know, this case has not been free and fair? Fortunately, Fortunately, this matter is a matter of international coverage. It's a matter that goes beyond the borders of Nigeria. Mm. And I believe um, that Nigeria being a state which obviously wishes that the world looks at it in good light, would um, trade carefully with respect to respecting the sanctity, the fairness, and the balance of justice with respect to the prosecution of this matter. It's very important that I state that um, Despite the fact that um, all these issues have happened, mm. yes, at the end of the day, uh, um, at the point of um, the final address of counsel, and before judgment is delivered in the matter, mm. the counsel to Nandekano has the right, he has the latitude to raise certain questions. Indeed, one of the questions which usually comes to fore in all trial is the issue of fair hearing. And the question of fair hearing is one which is very... Right. So that's absolutely open. fundamental. C certainly. Okay. Come. Uh, Kelechuku Henry, Kelechuku Eniotu, who is a lawyer and senior partner at the firm Law Corridor, I want to thank you very much indeed. Your analysis, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.